In this episode of Titans, Donald Trump. He's colorful, enigmatic, dynamic, larger than life. He is about as driven and motivated as anyone on the face of the planet. During the 1980s, Donald J. Trump, real estate mogul par excellence, sees his empire reach stratospheric heights before it almost all comes crashing down. It's almost amazing, though, that you're worth anywhere near this kind of money, because as I said, back in the 1990s, you owed something like $900 million. Your empire was pretty much, much more than that. He's come back in a way that is bigger and better than he probably ever imagined. What Trump did was recognize that the brand was bigger than the company. And that was a brilliant recognition. New York City, almost 14 miles of the most instantly recognizable skyline in the world. And since the mid-1970s, one man, more than any other, has been responsible for changing it. Donald J. Trump. People think of Trump as a showman, but I remember Trump as a guy who came on the scene and said, listen, I am going to make a mark on this city, and it's going to be a positive mark. He's built over a dozen high-rises in Manhattan, and his name graces nearly all of them. When you look at the horizon from anywhere in the world and you see New York, it's something special. People say, you know, that was mine, that was mine, that was mine, that was mine. Donald Trump, real estate mogul, best-selling author, and Emmy-nominated TV star. He is a titan of industry, a billionaire through a variety of enterprises. Although he has numerous critics, he has countless more fans and has become an American icon. Who loves the apprentice? Donald John Trump is born on June 14, 1946, in Queens, New York, the fourth child of Fred and Mary Trump. My father was a tough guy, strong guy, but a really good guy and a fair guy. And my mother was a homemaker, but she was smart, really smart. So I got lucky, and I learned a lot from both of them. Fred Trump is a successful real estate developer. He owns a lucrative business building and managing middle-income apartments in Queens and Brooklyn. He didn't build the glitz and the glamour. He knew bricks. He knew solidity. He knew Queens. This is where he was comfortable. So he built a, an empire of homes for ordinary people. Fred Trump is one of the largest landlords in New York's outer boroughs. At an early age, he begins to expose Donald and his brothers to the real estate business. I learned from really sitting on his lap, listening to him make deals over the years with contractors and everything else. And he was really my mentor and he was really a great teacher. Fred and Mary raised Donald and his four siblings in this 23-room house in Jamaica Estates, an exclusive enclave of Queens. Despite their wealth, Fred does not lavish his children with expensive gifts. We were brought up to value a dollar and to work, work, work. And Donald learned that lesson very well. Donald and his brothers work for their father, doing odd jobs at his apartment buildings and construction sites. All the boys learned the business from the bottom up. Perhaps it's part of Dad's lesson to us of humility. You don't start off uh, at the top, you start off cleaning bathrooms, cleaning kitchens, cleaning ovens to make it nice for the next people coming in. Fred also teaches his sons not to squander a single cent. He would go and look at his properties and if the bulbs were too bright he'd change the wattage. If a light didn't have to be on he would turn it off. It was a great education because ultimately the pennies do count and learning about the value of money and learning it from my father was very important. As a child, Donald is bright, energetic, and assertive, but he is also prone to mischief. At age 13, his parents sent him to the New York Military Academy. They hope Donald will benefit from the structured environment. Their decision pays off. In 1964, Donald graduates from the Academy. He enrolls in the prestigious Wharton School of Business at the University of Pennsylvania. After graduation, Donald returns to Queens and joins the family business. For the next five years, he works alongside his father, learning the ins and outs of the real estate industry. 
Fred had a lot of influence on Donald, but I also think Donald learned what he wanted to do and what he didn't want to do. While Trump admires his father's success, like any ambitious son, he wants to carve out his own identity. And he doesn't want to do it building middle-income apartments. He wants to build skyscrapers. Donald always had aspirations to do bigger and better. And uh, over time, Donald began to branch out. Trump sets his sights on the holy grail of real estate. He said, I'm going to go do my thing in real estate in Manhattan. You know, the biggest playground for real estate in the world. But Manhattan is a world away, and Donald will have to go it alone. His father has no interest in joining him. Manhattan didn't fit into his picture. He did really nicely in Brooklyn and Queens, and that's what he knew, that's what he understood. He knew his subject, and he didn't want to get involved with Manhattan. In 1971, at the age of 25, Donald moves to the Big Apple. He tells friends he is about to change the New York City skyline. A plan like this would be ambitious at any time, but in the early 70s, it is sheer lunacy. With debts totaling $6 billion, New York City is on the verge of bankruptcy. New York City was in really dire straits. They were one step away from defaulting on their bonds. There were a tremendous amount of foreclosures and nobody was building hotels. Those of us who lived in New York felt that it was a no-can-do place, that nobody could get anything done. But where others see futility, Trump sees opportunity. In 1974, he brokers a deal with Penn Central Railroad to purchase one of their distressed assets, the Commodore Hotel. Unfortunately, the timing is terrible. The location, right next to Grand Central Station, at one time the crown jewel of old New York, is now rife with crime and prostitution. The whole area around Grand Central Station, one of the landmarks of New York City, had become a, uh, not just a dump, but I mean, nobody wanted to go there. It was really run down. And the old Commodore had been used partially as a brothel, uh, of all things. Trump plans to gut the Commodore and transform it into a first-class hotel. In the process, he hopes to revitalize the neighborhood. It is an extremely complicated deal, so Trump hires an experienced lawyer. He's 27 years old, had no track record at all, and he had no hotel experience. He had never received any major mortgage money and hadn't had many dealings with the state. And I just thought it was pretty close to being impossible, and I told him so. Trump dismisses Ross's misgivings and forges ahead. Where a lot of people would have thrown their hands up and said, you know what, this is just too difficult, he saw the upside of it. Over the next two years, Donald does everything in his power to restore this once proud hotel to its former glory. He immerses himself in the ins and outs of the Manhattan real estate market, and he spends a lot of time networking with city power brokers. What I saw in Donald, basically, was a tremendous amount of enthusiasm. He had the ability to convince people that what he had in mind and was, was really going to happen. But it isn't just Trump's professional career that is taking off. In 1976, Trump meets 27-year-old Ivana Zelnichik. She is beautiful, confident, and wildly ambitious. In April 1977, the couple marries in a lavish wedding. With Ivana by his side, Trump presides over the reopening of the Commodore Hotel, now renamed the Grand Hyatt. The magnificent 34-story building features a new facade of shimmering glass, which reflects the image of Grand Central Terminal. And it changed how you felt about New York City. It was just incredible. You felt that there was an upswing. Just as Trump had hoped, the hotel sparks a revitalization of the neighborhood. And it establishes him as a heavyweight in Manhattan's real estate circles. It showed that he could do what he said he was going to do. Now, in real estate, a lot of people say, I'm going to do this, I'm going to build that, I'm going to buy this, and nothing happens. And Trump said, I'm going to build a hotel that's going to help the neighborhood, it's going to be beautiful, and he did it. That really set the trajectory of the rest of his career, and it really put him on the forefront of the development world at a very young age. When Titans returns, Trump expands his company's footprint in Manhattan and builds a shrine to its most important asset, himself. He really wanted to create something special, a building that's really symbolized what the Trump Organization is. If you asked 50 people, who were the top five real estate people 
they'd probably only be able to mention Donald Trump. And for good reason, because the other real estate people do not put their names on their buildings. In 1980, Donald Trump begins construction on his second major project in New York City. He plans to build a $200 million luxury high-rise on the site of the Bonwit Teller Building, a once proud department store on Fifth Avenue. He will name his new building Trump Tower. He wanted Trump Tower to be just a departure um, from what he had done in the past, and he really wanted to begin to create a brand. Trump Tower will provide tenants with upscale stores, high-end office space, and luxurious condominiums with breathtaking views of the city. But to do this, Trump Tower needs to be taller than its neighbors, presenting a unique challenge. And one of the major obstacles for Trump Tower getting it off the ground was really the air rights. Air rights determine the maximum height of a building. Trump has enough to construct a 48-story skyscraper, but he wants more. So he turns to his next-door neighbor, Tiffany and & Company, and compels them to sell their unused air rights for five million dollars. He convinces them that selling their air rights will preserve the integrity and beauty of the store. He then adds 20 stories to Trump Tower. People have said, I wonder why Tiffany was never developed. Well, they can't develop because they can't ever build higher than what they are. I have all of the air rights and I put them on top of Trump Tower. In early 1983, Trump Tower opens. The building features a stunning six-story atrium with an 80-foot waterfall made of pink marble. Trump Tower is something special. Somehow the color of the marble makes people look perhaps even better than they are. Above the front door, Trump puts his name in four-foot-high gold lettering. It is bold and brash, just like Trump. All of a sudden, I started getting a reputation, and it became a very good reputation because I knew what I was doing. When Trump Tower opens, it attracts high-end retailers and celebrity tenants, including Johnny Carson and Steven Spielberg. There was this connection, you know, Donald Trump. Oh, he builds great buildings. So people felt honored, and they paid a premium, sure. Trump's ability to attract the most sought-after customers causes a stir in New York. Donald's competition in real estate in Manhattan was fierce. There were a number of families, and they've been doing it for years, and all of a sudden you have this young upstart that says, I'm going to turn real estate on its ear. He put a face on development, and then he did development that we loved. Unlike his competitors, Trump has created a brand, and he is not shy about using the media to promote it. He saw getting good media coverage as a way to sell his product. He needed people to understand that the name Trump was supposed to signify excellence, high quality, great standards of building. This strategy pays off. Throughout the 80s, Trump continues to dominate the Manhattan real estate scene. His net worth is $500 million and growing. The 80s was a great time. It was a very exciting time. But in a certain way, it was bad because it was too easy. It was like shooting fish in a barrel. With two ultra-successful Manhattan properties under his belt, Trump sets his sight on the gaming industry in nearby Atlantic City. The way he got into Atlantic City was really with the mindset of a real estate guy. He looked at those assets and he saw value. In the mid-1980s, Trump opens two casino hotels, Trump Plaza and Trump Castle. Atlantic City, when I first got involved, was young. It was vibrant. It was very lucrative, very profitable. To attract even more visitors, Trump holds professional boxing matches at the convention center. Celebrities, professional athletes, and politicians flock to Atlantic City. He intrinsically understands and has his finger on the pulse of what people want and how people want to be entertained and how people want to enjoy themselves. So he brought in the best boxers. I brought Mike Tyson to Atlantic City. I brought Larry Holmes and so many others. I'd take the convention center, rent it out, and we'd sell 15 to 18,000 tickets, and it was a very exciting time. Trump's casinos are a gold mine. Two years after opening, they gross $30 million per month. The bigger question becomes where to invest the profits. He could either pour them back into the casino hotels, or he could siphon off the money to use to build up his real estate in New York. Well, he preferred to put the money into his real estate in New York, because that's what he loved. Back in Manhattan, Trump develops other properties, including Trump Plaza, Trump Park, and the St. Moritz Hotel. I've always had a great relationship with New York City. I love the people. I even love the politicians. He'll do anything he can, basically, to support the city. He's critical when things are not being handled the way he thinks they ought to be handled. 
In July 1986, Trump criticizes the city's ongoing efforts to renovate Wolman Rink, a popular ice skating spot in Central Park. The city spent 20 million over a seven year period and had no idea what they were doing. Trump is disgusted by the city's inefficient use of time and resources. He contacts Mayor Ed Koch and offers to complete the renovation for $3 million. He said, guys, give it to me. I'm going to do it in a few months. I'll do it under budget and it'll actually work. Initially, Koch balks at Trump's offer. But after the media runs the story, the mayor agrees to let Donald take the reins. Construction begins in July 1986. Four months later, Trump finishes the project on time and $750,000 under budget. They're declaring you as the guy who gets things done. Well, I do get things done. I work hard and I hopefully know what I'm doing. And it's worked out fantastically and I'm very, very proud. On November 13, 1986, with typical Trump fanfare, Woolman Rink reopens. I give Ed Koch and Commissioner Henry Stern tremendous credit for having the courage to say, Donald, go and do it. You just saw the modest Donald Trump. <laughs> and I am delighted to thank him. What do you think of the show? Fabulous, just great. And we have Donald Trump to thank for it. Six years without ice skating in Central Park was a bit too much. It takes only three months to do it when you know how. Trump is equally busy on the home front. In their luxurious Trump Tower penthouse, he and Ivana raised their three children, Don Jr., Ivanka, and Eric. Family to me has always been very important, but I was this young guy doing deals all over the place, and I was very busy. Despite his hectic schedule, Donald always makes time for his children. Like his father, Trump has an open-door policy for his family. We'd see him every day after school, but it would be, you know, upstairs in this building in his very offices. And when we showed up, we were able to stay. And whether that was him screaming at a contractor or negotiating major deals, you know, there, there was never a time where he just said, you guys have to leave. Donald and Ivana do their best to keep their children grounded, just as Trump's father had done with him. My parents were very careful to make sure that we took nothing for granted and they were constantly reminding us that one has to work extremely hard for anything that they get in life but trump's advice is not just reserved for his family in 1987 he publishes his autobiography the art of the deal the book gives readers an intimate look inside the life of the donald it's an instant hit the Art of the Deal was the number one bestseller on the New York Times list and every other list for many, many, many weeks. So that took me into another level. Donald was becoming a superstar at that time. And all of a sudden, this person that started out with his dad in Brooklyn had now become this magnificent figure that transgressed many different businesses. The kid from Queens is on a roll. Financiers watch in awe as everything he touches seems to turn to gold. Everyone wanted to be a banker for Donald Trump. If Donald said, I need 60 million, the bank would say, take 80, because at this point he was the golden boy and it was going to work out well. Beginning in the mid-1980s, Trump starts to use these loans to diversify his investments. He buys the New Jersey Generals in the fledgling United States Football League. He also sponsors the Tour de Trump, a multi-stage cycling race that winds across the Northeast. By the time the riders complete the 1,100 miles of the Tour de Trump bicycle race, they will have seen 13 of these start-finish lines. Trump understands that every single purchase furthers his ultimate goal, extending the Trump brand. He purchases a $30 million yacht and Mar-a-Lago, a sprawling $8 million estate in Palm Beach, Florida. He even buys an airline and names it the Trump Shuttle. It's going to be the best run transportation company anywhere. In 1988, Trump buys the Grand Dame of New York City hotels, the Plaza, for a cool $390 million. Later that year, back in Atlantic City, Trump begins the construction of his third and most expensive casino, the Trump Taj Mahal. The $1 billion casino is a huge gamble. The Taj will need to generate $1 million a day just to cover the annual debt payments. Unfortunately for Trump, after a decade-long winning streak, his luck is about to run out. The 1980s has been a time of extraordinary growth and prosperity. But as the decade comes to a close, the economic winds are shifting. Donald Trump's attitude and everybody else's attitude was there won't be a recession. What happens very often in any real estate or any successful entrepreneur is then you get so enthralled with your own success that you didn't realize that, that there's a possibility of a downturn and how you could get severely hurt. Next on Titans, will a floundering economy prove too tough for Trump to overcome? 
when you borrow too much, it's great in good times, but in bad times, you get absolutely crushed. New York City had a lot of uh, financial institutions, both in the stock market uh, after the 87 crash, but more importantly, uh, overextended savings and loans. And the loose lending caused tremendous overbuilding. And almost every financial institution and developer had a grave, grave problem. And the bigger you thought, probably the more grave your problem was. On January 1st, 1990, the real estate market in New York City collapsed. And Donald Trump's situation plummeted. Banks drastically cut lending, and the credit crunch makes it nearly impossible for companies to borrow money. It led to huge defaults with banks all over the place, but in particular, the real estate business was really hurt. And you couldn't finance anything. And when the banks stop lending and you're in business, generally speaking, you have trouble. And he had trouble. The economic woes trickle down through the economy. Trump's once bustling casinos grow quiet. In New York City, property values plummet, along with Trump's net worth. He has spread himself too thin. Now, with insufficient revenue, he can't make his loan payments, which total more than $350 million a year. You know, in those days, you'd invest every single penny in deals, and you'd have nothing left over because you want to maximize. But the problem is when the world crashes, you're not you don't have the cash balances that you need. As Trump's empire crumbles, so does his marriage to Ivana. And his relationship with Southern beauty Marla Maples becomes fodder for gossip columns. It was Why? the ultimate soap. It was New York City. It was me and a beautiful wife. It was a beautiful girlfriend. The publicity was so incredible, so much. By June 1990, Trump is on the brink of financial ruin. He owes $9 billion in business loans and another $975 million in personal guarantees. Donald Trump could have blamed the economy completely on his troubles, his financial difficulties. But he realized that, to some extent, he was at fault as well. How did you let it slip away? There are people who say that your ego was partly to blame. I hit so many home runs in a row. I mean, it's like a batter gets up and hits 20 home runs in a row, and I started not focusing that, and all of a sudden I had to get back to work. Trump needs a bit of his old magic to avoid bankruptcy. I could see the handwriting on the wall. There was going to be trouble. The markets were collapsing all over the world. When I saw institutions that were powerful institutions going bad, I called up all of my banks. I got them into a room, and I made a deal with them. Trump reveals the extent of his problems. He needs a $65 million bridge loan to keep the Trump organization from collapsing. Trump convinced them that, you know, I've got a great thing going here. I was making money hand over fist in the 80s because I had branded myself. And my name is worth a lot of money. You can either foreclose on me and then you're never going to get back your $9 billion. Or you can lend me the money to pay off my debt. Trump is a bankable figure. You had to ride with him. Now, you could argue that Trump was too big to fail. Trump's lenders agree to bail him out. They loan him an additional $65 million and agree to defer all interest and principal for five years. They realized that they needed Donald Trump. As much as he needed them, they needed him. Trump has just pulled off the most important deal of his life. It's a long road back. But one thing Trump never lacks is perseverance. What's interesting about my father is, you know, when faced with adversity, that's when he performs best. But the press doesn't share Trump's optimism. They're poised, pens in hand, to write his business obituary. It's a very bad feeling when you're the hot boy in town, and then all of a sudden you're reading stories on front pages that maybe you're not going to make it. And I think probably more than anything that fueled my enthusiasm or my energy to get up and prove people wrong. The easy money of the 80s may have dried up, but Trump is more determined than ever to rebuild his empire. I remember him coming home at 2, 3 in the morning. I'd hear the door open and, and he'd be out at 6 o'clock in the morning, you know, back in the office and doing whatever he had to do to make sure he could stay afloat. One of Trump's first moves is to streamline his investments. Trump sells a number of his assets, including the Trump shuttle, his yacht, and controlling interest in the Plaza Hotel. To bring in additional revenue, he converts Mar-a-Lago into an exclusive club. Trump's three Atlantic City casinos file for Chapter 11 prepackaged bankruptcy. They emerge shortly after with restructured debt and lower interest rates. 
As the 90s roll on, the country claws itself out of the recession, and Trump's empire begins to recover. By 1993, Trump has reduced his personal debt from $975 million to $115 million. His personal life is looking up as well. October 13, 1993. Trump and Marla Maples celebrate the birth of their daughter, Tiffany. Two months later, they exchange vows at the Plaza Hotel. In 1995, Trump reduces his stake in his privately owned Atlantic City casinos. He raises $2 billion in a public offering, which he uses to pay off his remaining debts. And by 1995, he, thanks to the banks, he was debt free. And he went on a, a rampage after that. You learn during bad times about yourself. You learn if you can handle pressure. You learn if you can really think quickly and on your feet. And if you can't, you're going to go out of business, and that's going to be the end of the game. It's take me home, mommy. With renewed vigor and focus, Trump pursues new projects in Manhattan. One of them is 40 Wall Street, a dilapidated and nearly vacant 1929 landmark. 40 Wall Street was just a deal that made sense through and through. It was a basically a case study of how to buy a distressed asset. In 1995, Trump purchases the building for pennies. After a $35 million makeover, prospective tenants flock to sign leases. Virtually overnight, the property value soars. It's one of the greatest success stories, I think, in the history of New York real estate, where you, you know, buy a building for a million, you put some money in, and you have a building that's worth three, four hundred million dollars, um, you know, today. I want one of those in my career, right, to have that kind of ROI, that return on investment is just, you know, phenomenal. As a way to expand his empire without overextending it, Trump begins to partner with other developers. In exchange for a share of the profits, Trump lends his development expertise, property management skills, and most importantly, his name. In the mid-1990s, Trump teams up with GE Capital to turn the Gulf and Western building into Trump International Hotel and Tower, a 52-story luxury condo hotel. With its awe-inspiring views and impeccable five-star service, Trump International sets a new standard for luxury. By 1997, Trump is back on the Forbes 400 list for the first time in six years. His net worth is estimated at $2 billion. But this success comes with a price. In 1999, his marriage to Marla Maples ends. She says she could not convince you to spend time with the family that work and deals always, always came first. I love working, and I think I'm a very good father. I'm not sure I'm as good a husband as I am a father. Trump's children are always a top priority. Despite their messy and public divorce, Donald and his first wife, Ivana, remain cordial and continue to raise their kids together, keeping them on the right track. And we always had jobs at very early ages. They was here, this is what you're doing this summer. We worked for the people that, that worked for him. Um, and we made minimum wage doing it. And he really tried to instill um, not only the job and how certain jobs get done, but also really the value of the dollar. In 2001, Don Jr. follows in his father's footsteps and joins the family business. It's great working for him. I mean, he's a fair guy. He'll give you autonomy. He'll let you make up your own mind. But if he tells you one way and you overrule it and you go the other way, you damn well better be right because you'll hear about it for the rest of your life. Don Jr. isn't the only person vying for an opportunity with the Donald. In 2003, TV producer Mark Burnett has New York on his mind. After 15 seasons filming in remote and wild locations, he's ready for a change of scenery. I was desperate to actually make a show that allowed me to live in a city. I thought, what do people really, really need in a city? It's jobs. And the big question was, well, what's the job that everyone's going to sign up for and really want? It doesn't take Burnett long to figure it out. I met Donald Trump a couple of years earlier, which was kind of a dream for me. And now I thought, he would be the ideal person to be the boss people are vying to work for. A few months later, Burnett pitches his idea to Trump. He calls the show The Apprentice. Don said to me, this shows what business is really like and how tough it is to make it. I want to do this. And he said, in Trump style, but what's the deal? And I knew there was only one deal I could make. He said, let's go 50-50 on this. He put his hand out, we shook hands, and um, history began. When Titans returns, can Trump build a TV audience? NBC knew that they were risking a huge amount. I mean, Donald Trump had no track record in television. His own agents and managers told him not to do it.
He's not only a brilliant businessman, he's a celebrity, he's a star. And that has an effect on people. And my job and the, the job of my team is to capture that. January 2004, The Apprentice premieres on NBC. Donald Trump not only stars in the show, but also serves as an executive producer. In this dual role, he earns more than $1 million per episode. For the next 15 weeks, 16 contestants compete to win a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, a one-year $250,000 job with the Trump Organization. So when the winner of this thing gets a job with you? For at least a year. That's the winner? And you know what the loser place? gets? <laughs> second place is three years. Three years. Yeah. Thank you. The first time we actually met Donald, we were all kind of, you know, looking up at him in awe. And it was like, wow, you know, let the games begin. Each week, the talented group of aspiring apprentices vie for this coveted spot. We had people from Harvard and some of the, you know, the best business schools in the country. But the real drama of The Apprentice takes place in the boardroom, where each week Trump fires one contestant. You're fired. It's a rough and tumble world in New York City business, and Trump makes The Apprentice that rough. It's not an environment of hugs, it's an environment of toughness. The Apprentice is the breakout hit of the 2004 season. Donald and Mark did something that no one had ever done. They had made a show about business. It was exciting, and it was thrilling, and it just caught on like wildfire. As more and more people tune in, Trump's popular catchphrase becomes a sensation. You're fired. Everybody walked around the country saying, you're fired, you're fired. And of course they associated that with Donald Trump. I thought I was known very well before The Apprentice, but really now it's at a much higher level. It's not even a contest. It was a great turning point for Trump and for the brain. People got to see, you know, the side of Donald Trump that they've never seen before. He's a likable guy. He's a funny guy. Great sense of humor. Never one to squander an opportunity, Trump capitalizes on his newfound celebrity with a variety of lucrative licensing deals. If you get something with the Trump name on it, you're getting something that's of value. Over the next few years, the Trump name graces a wide variety of products, including bottled water and premium vodka, even though he doesn't drink alcohol. He also launches a line of power suits and ties, promotes affordable luxury home goods, and even cologne, all with the Trump name. It just really took the Trump brand, you know, to a different level, perhaps a demographic that we don't necessarily cater to um, in our real estate. Ever since the art of the deal, Trump has enjoyed imparting his knowledge of business to others. I've always said you have to love what you do. I love to educate people, and I love teaching them what I've learned so they can go out and do the same thing themselves. In 2005, he puts his name on Trump University, an online destination for business and real estate courses. He pulls in upwards of $1 million for speaking engagements, and even finds time to write several best-selling books. Following Bill Rancic's win on The Apprentice, the hometown boy accepts a job as Donald's second-in-command on his latest project, the Trump International Hotel and Tower in Chicago. A lot of people think Donald Trump is, they just view him as this billionaire. And at the end of the day, the guy is a gifted builder. It was my job to take in and absorb and soak up as much as I possibly could, and that's what I did. I watched how he made decisions. During construction, engineers proposed wrapping Trump International in horizontal steel wraps. And within 30 seconds, Donald said, you can't do it that way because the pigeons in Chicago are going to poop and you'll never get that thing clean. And these architects were kind of looking at each other and they couldn't believe that they didn't think of it. With the real estate market booming and his image as a bona fide celebrity secure, Trump turns to his favorite pastime. My father started buying golf courses so he had something to tinker with on the weekend while playing golf. Trump provides players with challenging fairways, breathtaking features and luxurious amenities. He loves the game. He appreciates the game. He gets it, and he gives people who are real golfers, you know, what they're looking for. Yeah, right, it's going to be okay. On January 22, 2005, Trump marries his longtime girlfriend, Melania Knauss. This time around, he promises, I'm going to devote more time to the wife. The following year, Trump and Melania welcome a son, Baron William. Trump's family isn't the only thing that's growing. By 2006, Ivanka and Eric Trump join the family business. He always says to us, you know, love what you do. If you don't, you'll never do it well. And if you don't put in that extra time because you don't really enjoy it, I'll know and I'll fire you like a dog. But Trump doesn't have to worry. He's taught his earliest apprentices well. They don't take a paycheck for granted. They come to work every single day, uh, leave late into the evening, work on weekends when called upon, into the any hours they're asked to work, they're there. 
In the mid-2000s, a bubble begins to form in the real estate market. Prices shoot to historic levels. But this time, as a voice of reason, Trump cautions against irrational exuberance. At the height of this real estate frenzy, I was telling thousands of people, don't buy real estate now. And I sort of listened to my own advice, and I didn't go crazy. My father was very restrained during this time, but we wanted to continue to grow and continue to expand our footprint. So we created a hotel company. The Trump Organization establishes the Trump Hotel Collection and develops projects in Las Vegas, Waikiki, and Manhattan's stylish Soho. But Trump refrains from investing a substantial amount of his own money. Our equity is our brand and we can add a lot of value from that perspective and a lot of projects that we may not necessarily be the developer of, but you know, we're creating a lot of value for those developers. People will pay more for a Trump building. They're equating it to quality, that they know it's going to be a quality product that it's going to stay a quality product because Donald is so careful in, in the management of a property with his name on it. Next on Titans, with Trump a household name in America, can he take his brand global? I think we have the hottest brand in the world and I think the future is really bright for Trump. First and foremost, we'll always be developers. It's, it's in our blood. We'll always have these little side projects just to keep us entertained. But real estate in this company will always come first. The exposure created by The Apprentice is priceless for Donald Trump and the Trump Organization. There is no amount of money that could buy you an hour prime time on NBC on a weekly basis to promote all things Trump. So it really is um, one of the great assets of this organization. The Apprentice brings Trump into the homes of more than 20 million viewers each week. But soon, he'll also reach an international audience. One of the things that The Apprentice really allowed him to do is it really opened him up to, frankly, the rest of the world. We've got some of the highest prices ever for television sold overseas for the show. Syndication deals bring the show to more than 160 countries. Its popularity also inspires nearly two dozen international spin-offs. We were really beginning our international expansion at the same time that the show was launched. We were doing projects and really launching the brand all over the world. By introducing the brand to international markets, the Trump family hopes to take their business to the next level. What's next within the Trump Organization is really to um, become less of a New York-centric company. And we want to have a hotel in every major city in the world. Um, it's got to be the best location, and it's got to be an incredible asset, so it's going to take some time. In 2010, they get one step closer to their dream. In early April, Trump Soho, the latest addition in their line of luxury hotels, opens to rave reviews in downtown Manhattan. There's nothing like this. We have the best views of any hotel in New York City, and it's just different. It's a different kind of product. We have the ability to put heads in beds during the week, the kind of Monday through Thursday crowd, and then we have the bar and the restaurants and all the hip things to really put heads in beds on the weekend for that trendy crowd that's coming into downtown. Trump doesn't invest a lot of his own money in Trump Soho. Instead, he licenses his name in exchange for a cut of the profits. He also continues to partner with companies that sell consumer products. In 2009, Trump forms the Trump Network, a multi-level marketing company that promotes health and wellness products, including vitamins and supplements. When I did The Apprentice, it was a long shot. This is not a long shot. This is going to be something that's really amazing. We're absolutely thrilled to have Mr. Trump as our partner. He doesn't put his name on anything that isn't the very best. And so that really has given us an opportunity to be the best in our industry. In 2010, Trump capitalizes on his love of golf and celebrity to create Donald J. Trump's fabulous world of golf for the Golf Channel. Each week, Trump provides color commentary as celebrities and professional athletes go head to head on one of his exclusive courses. Today's match, movie star Mark Wahlberg takes on TV star and good friend Kevin Dillon, and they're bringing their entourage. Although Donald Trump makes millions of dollars in a variety of enterprises, real estate remains the cornerstone of his empire. And after more than 40 years in the business, he's more driven than ever. The amount of mornings I wake up to a 6 o'clock call where I have no idea it's him and he starts talking about some new golf course that we want to purchase or some little detail. Donald's greatest skill as a business leader 
is his ability to build enthusiasm for an idea in all of his people and all the people working on it. And then he has the ability to delegate. But despite his willingness to give his employees autonomy, there is one aspect of his business Donald Trump can't give up. He loves to negotiate. Maybe that's, you know, the boy from Queens, or maybe it's just a pragmatic business guy. But, you know, hey, if you can save an extra $50,000 on a half a million dollar contract, you know, that's a pretty good phone call if it takes you five minutes. Not bad, right? That desire to keep a close eye on his cash stems from his brush with financial ruin 20 years earlier. Our company today is now worth in excess of $6 billion. I think I learned to keep cash, stay conservative. I enjoy borrowing. But I also know that when you borrow too much, it's great in good times, but in bad times you get absolutely crushed. You never heard one thing written about Donald Trump being in financial trouble during these last few years. You know, lots of other developers had bankruptcies. Donald Trump came through it unscathed. You know, I love it. I just, I, I love what I'm doing. I love the position of the company. I love what we've done with the brand. During the course of his amazing career, Donald Trump has promoted his buildings as the biggest and the best. But more than anything, he wanted to impress his own father. Not long ago, when Donald had one of his many triumphs, I can't remember which one, he said to me, what do you think Dad would have said? And I said, I think he would have said, I'm so proud of you. I believe that my father's legacy will always be rooted in real estate. He's changed the skyline in a very real way. He's proven that you could be successful by being out there every day in people's faces, telling them why what you're doing is the best and proving that it's the best. But no matter how successful Donald Trump becomes, he says his greatest achievement is his children. I've been given a great amount of credit for the success of my children. And I'm very proud of that. Ultimately, that's more important than brick and mortar. It's more important than anything. When you get older, what are you going to remember? No drugs, no alcohol, no cigarettes, no tattoos. Give me a kiss. Bye. Yeah, but only temporary no. tattoos.